Hello, this is Dr. Richard Senelik, and I'm glad you were able to join us for this educational program on stroke. Uh, it's an introductory program and should take about an hour um, and give you an introduction to stroke, why it happens, and how to prevent it. Uh, just to let you know, we're recording this on February 6, uh, 2018, so that if new data becomes available uh, between now and when you're watching this, you'll, you'll understand why it might be different. Uh, I'm a neurologist who has specialized in neurorehabilitation uh, for about the last 40 years. I'm also the editor-in-chief of Encompass Health Press, and we produce uh, quite a bit of educational content. So this is just one of several programs that are available to you. Uh, we hope you'll enjoy it, uh, and we'll try some of the others that we have. Let's start with stroke facts. Uh, everybody knows about stroke. Most people know somebody that's had a stroke, has somebody in their family. Uh, if you've worked in a rehab hospital, you've seen lots of strokes or in acute care. And the reason is there's 795,000 strokes each year, of which 610,000 are new strokes, so that then the difference would be recurrent strokes. If you've had a stroke, and we'll talk about that in a bit, you're more likely to have another stroke. What's steadily increasing is that there are 6.8 million stroke survivors because we're getting much better at treating stroke, treating the comorbidities that go along with it, diabetes, hypertension. And when I did this lecture, ooh, I can't tell you how many years ago it was we did the first one, but it's less than 10, that's for sure. That number was 5.5 million. So you can see that that's really increasing quite a bit. The fastest growing segment of our population is 85 and older. It's kind of the oldest old. So we're gonna see more and more people with stroke, people that have survived stroke, needing rehabilitation, uh, needing prevention that we're gonna talk about a lot. Where the, we've really made progress again is reducing death in stroke. When I did this lecture the last time, stroke was the third leading cause of death and it is now the fifth leading cause of death. So it's decreased. Heart disease and cancer are number uh, one and two right up there at the top. But where it causes problems, it's the leading cause of disability in adults. So that you come out of the stroke with many symptoms that we're gonna talk about, whether they be paralysis, speech disturbance, cognitive problems. Uh, and the key, the reason for doing all of this education is that many strokes are preventable that you may get a warning sign, a transient ischemic attack, or you may have risk factors that if you tightly control uh, and work hard, you can prevent yourself from having a stroke. Uh, and the important thing to know is that if you've had a stroke, stroke rehabilitation works. Patients who get rehabilitation do much better than those who don't. Where you go for rehabilitation does make a difference. If you go to an inpatient rehabilitation hospital, you're three times more likely to make it home than if you go to a skilled nursing facility. Uh, that's a, another one of these lectures that you can look for, uh, which is where should rehabilitation take place. Remember we talked about it's the leading cause of impairment. So for a 65-year-old who has a stroke, and I trust me, that's a young person. Uh, it is the World Health Organization for elderly, but um, I'm beyond that and still working and going strong. Uh, but let's look at a 65-year-old who's six months post-stroke. 26% of them, so a fourth, are going to be dependent in activities daily living. And the highest correlation of self-esteem in a human being uh, is bladder and bowel and the ability to perform activities of daily living. I have lots of patients and know lots of people who travel the world uh, in a wheelchair, who are paraplegic, quadriplegic, run companies, motivational speakers. And activities daily living then it's, are much higher as far as quality of life and how well somebody does and their ability to go home than mobility. 46% will have some cognitive deficit. And a lot of times we overlook that. We're just saying, well, they seem pretty good but we're not looking at the higher level cognitive problems, a lot of time executive functions, planning, judgment, organization. And 50% of major stroke survivors view their situation as worse than death. And that's, that, that's a discouraging number. And it means we have a lot more work to do. Um, 
because somebody who has a hemiparesis is, and use that then is not getting the resources they need. Uh, and as we'll discuss in a bit, depression gets to be a major problem in stroke survivors, not just because of the stroke, which is more common if it occurs in the left hemisphere, but also because of the biological changes that just take place. It's an adjustment to disability, but also there's biological changes that take place in the brain. This is an interesting phenomena, the stroke belt. If, let me see if I can get my pointer to work, and there it is. So if we kind of go down here in the deep south, the real deep purple, and, and don't ask me to, na to name these states, um, I think this is Georgia over here, this is Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, and if I'm wrong, um, well, you can yell at somebody, but not me. I live here in Texas, down here in San Antonio, down here, and you can see we're kind of a purplish, and we have a large Hispanic population, which is more likely uh, to have a stroke because of um, comorbidities, diabetes, hypertension. Uh, but if we look at that stroke belt, uh, and let me see if I get my pointer back. Let me go back up. There's my pointer. We're not really sure why this is. There's a higher African-American population, higher incidence of diabetes and hypertension. But you can see it's much higher incidence. This is what's called the stroke belt. And you have a 20% greater chance of dying if you live in the stroke belt. So this is a slide I gave you a little sneak peek of. And it's who gets a stroke. Uh, these people are obviously, it's a staged photo, so they're all happy and they're smiling. Uh, but such is not always the case. We'll call these stroke survivors who've done really well. And you can see, uh, let me see if I can get my pointer back. I keep going to the next slide. Uh, it's a disease, here we go, age. It's not so much a disease of young people, although there are strokes in young people and a whole bunch of reasons why they have stroke as opposed to older. But as we age, 60 to 79, and you can see 80 plus, it's really a disease as we age and we get more atherosclerosis in the arteries in the brain. It happens later than it does in, in uh, heart disease. So heart disease, maybe the prevalence is much uh, higher in, in that 60 to 79, and then stroke comes on later in life. Uh, and I'll always have therapists come up to me and say, you know, we really ought to do a young stroke program. We ought to get it organized and offer for people that had a, a patient who was a young stroke and they were a delight to work with. And I go, well, we take care of those folks, but really our people, and you're going to see the most of, are older people with a lot of comorbidities. Uh, and they can be harder to take care of because of that, uh, but this is who gets stroke. So now we're going to talk about stroke mechanism, and, and I may have to sort of stay away from my pointer there if, if, if I'm going to keep switching slides every time. So here's anatomy. Uh, my pointer is working right now. This is the front of the brain, the frontal lobe. This is executive functions, planning, judgment, organization. Uh, Broca's area for production of motor speech. Comprehension back here, Wernicke's area. The motor strip, so the legs are up here and we get down here, the hand and face. Uh, and it's organized in a, in a very uh, strict fashion of legs, abdomen. And then the hand and the face are much larger than the feet or the belly because we use our lips and our hands they for tactile function, for speech, requires a lot more um, gray matter, a lot more neurons and connectivity. Behind it is the sensory strip for sensation. Moving backwards, we can go all the way back to the occipital lobe, which is the visual area. And there we can recognize, or recognize probably the wrong word, we're aware that the brain has seen something, but to interpret it, it has to go forward into the temporal lobe and parietal lobe and kind of go through your tickler file and figure out what's going on. So where we have a stroke and the size of the stroke makes a difference as to the type of symptoms. And I'm going to show you some pictures um, that will give you an idea of why it matters where the stroke takes place. So an ischemic stroke occurs when the artery to a part of the brain is clogged. So these arteries come up and they branch off and these little tiny arteries that I'm showing you are called the lenticulostriates 
and they get affected in hypertension. And all of the information from all these neurons that are out here on the periphery of the brain stream down on cables, white matter, and go through this area called the internal capsule. So you can have a big stroke here that causes paralysis of one side of the body, or you can have a not so big stroke right here where all the information is going through. So as luck would have it, these lenticulostriates are very susceptible to bursting a hemorrhage or closing off and a stroke that maybe is only as big as I'm drawing, it's probably smaller than a dime, uh, can cause paralysis, loss of speech, vision on one side of the body. If we drop down here, you can see there's a buildup of hardening of the arteries, this yellow stuff, and so the artery gets narrowed and then a blood clot can form. And what happens a lot of times is that these um, deposits of cholesterol burst or break and then it closes off and that's why people may have a sudden heart attack because they've had the narrowing but then that uh, deposit of cholesterol bursts and you go ahead and get the clot. And the further out you get, the arteries get more narrow. I'll show you a picture that usually it's kind of like the sprinkler system on your lawn and when an artery closes off it may be a pie-shaped area that is affected and how much is it's affected depends on whether other arteries are able to overlap. So think about it if you go away in the summer and you've got your sprinkler system set and uh, one of the stations stops working. Well they overlap a little bit if you've done it right so the area where it overlaps maybe a little brown or maybe it survived just fine but the area of where the sprinkler head wasn't working and there was no overlap that's what dies so in the brain we call that collateral blood flow if there are good collaterals blood flow coming from another area then that area of the brain may survive so here's what we see with a slow buildup of uh, if we get over here on the left side, we can see a nice normal artery, number one. Number two, we start to have platelets and blood cells start to form. We can see things start to get a little thickened. And then number four, we're getting a deposit of cholesterol and fat. And now it kind of bursts and we start to get a blood clot. And the platelets start to stick to fibrin. Uh, and we start to get a clot. Maybe they didn't get a stroke, so we go on to six as a cross section through there, and we see that the atherosclerosis is getting worse, and now we're starting to get a little clot forming on it. So that this is a slow process that can take years to form. Um, a lot of those cheeseburgers, I love green chili cheeseburgers here in San Antonio, and if I want to be really bad, I'll go get a green chili cheeseburger with french fries and a sweet tea. Um, I don't even want to know how many calories that is. So the types of strokes, the majority, vast majority of strokes, what we call ischemic strokes, indeed 87 percent of all strokes, and that's where a blood vessel closes off uh, and there's blockage then beyond that point and the brain may die. It may be susceptible to dying and that's, as you'll see later, we do interventions, we give clot busters, we can now go up and retrieve that clot or suck it out. Uh, and if there's good collaterals, maybe the um, size of the stroke won't be as bad. But remember a couple slides ago where we talked about real estate. It matters which real estate is involved so that if it's in that important internal capsule, small stroke may cause a lot of damage. It may be a big stroke, but not in an area that's motor function, sensory function, uh, may not cause as much problem. Hemorrhagic strokes are exactly what it sounds like. It's when a blood vessel bursts uh, or it leaks, an aneurysm can leak, uh, and I'll show you pictures on uh, CTs and MRI scans what it looks like. CT scan is uh, highly sensitive toward blood and it's why when uh, somebody comes to the emergency room we immediately get a CT scan and not an MRI because the CT tells us what, what we need to know. Embolic stroke means that the clot came from someplace else, usually the heart, 
um, maybe the aortic arch, and went up toward the brain. So it came from one place and went to another place. So 20 to 30 percent of all ischemic strokes are embolic, where that clot didn't originate right there in the brain, but came from the heart. We're going to talk about atrial fibrillation, where blood clots form within the heart and then go up to the brain. The, on the left side of your screen uh, is an ischemic stroke, and that big blue arrow then is pointing toward uh, the damaged brain. This is a slice through the brain of obviously a patient that died. Uh, it's like we were looking through the front. Uh, I took a slice, and now I'm looking at the front. And you can see it's that wedge shape that I talked about, that the arteries tend to supply uh, blood to the brain in a pie-shaped distribution so that the piece of pie right next to it, if it overlapped well enough, maybe we wouldn't have so much damage. That All that red is what we call hyperemic. This was a big, fresh stroke. Uh, and now on the right side, the blue arrow is pointing toward a blood clot. Uh, and that blood clot is right in the middle of the internal capsule. If you remember, I, I showed you the area where all of the uh, information from the neurons at the top in the cortex are coming down through that highway. If you look just to the left side of that, um, there's sort of a white strip going through um, an area on either side. I can't get my uh, pointer to work without changing slides. Now, I'm going to do that just because it's worth doing. And there I've got my pointer back. So this is the internal capsule. And so all of the information from up here comes through this white matter, comes down through the internal capsule. And so now this hemorrhage was right in there. Now this hemorrhage caused lots of problems because it caused lots of swelling. This is the ventricle, it has spinal fluid in it. And see how it's compressed? It, this has all the swelling around this blood clot and this brain probably got herniation um, and then the patient stopped breathing and the heart stopped and obviously, obviously they died. So this is a big blood clot uh, and one that if we could get to aggressively enough, um, if the patient was having that much trouble, you might try and take out. So a CT scan uh, is computerized tomography. It's been around uh, since about 1975, 1976, so for a long time. In the old days, uh, when I first went into practice, it would take four minutes a slice, and we took Polaroid pictures, and it was, it was fabulous to get the pictures, uh, but if you had to sedate patients, now it's seconds. It, it's amazing. You can do a whole CT scan in 15, 30 seconds, and you get all these slices through the brain. So on the left side, we see a big stroke, and that's the black area, the damaged brain. So if someone was coming in with a stroke and we're taking them off to the CT scanner, we want to decide whether to give them TPA, and we want to know, do they have a big stroke, and would they be at, at risk for bleeding into their brain if we gave them a clot buster? This is what we see on the left, this arrow, this big stroke, and it's pushing everything over to the other side. On the right side, you can see how sensitive a CT scan is to blood. So that hemorrhage that I showed you on the previous slide it doesn't take much blood. It doesn't have to be a big blood clot like this. Uh, shows up very easily on a CT scan. And here again, remember we talked about real estate and location makes a difference. So here on the left side, we see a stroke that isn't that big. It's a probably what we call a giant lacune. Little tiny black dots like that are uh, called lacunes or lakes. In French, lacune et tatier. If there's any French majors, I butchered that probably terribly. Um, so little lakes, and you can get multiple lacunes or lacunar infarcts, and if you get enough of these, patients can get dementia and deteriorate. But this one is right in that area I showed you on the other slide where everything goes through all the motor fibers, sensory fibers, visual fibers. And so even though it's not very big, this patient might have paralysis um, and loss of sensation on the opposite side of the body. And on the right side is just another example of showing you a large um, 
hemorrhage and how easily that shows up on, on scans. Will a stroke always show up on a scan? Uh, this article, it, don't read, try and read what's on there. It's for me to make a point and as a reminder of what to say. So what happens if we see a patient and they come to the acute care hospital or they're admitted to rehab, let's say, and they've got paralysis on one side of the body and their MRI doesn't show much or doesn't show anything? Well, the key is they've still had a stroke. So just because the MRI or the CT scan was negative doesn't mean they didn't have a stroke if clinically they've had a stroke. If the patient presents and they have weakness on one side of their body and loss of sensation, trouble speaking, maybe visual disturbance, doesn't matter that the CT is negative or the MRI is negative, uh, those folks have had a stroke. And a lot of times what we see in rehab uh, is that folks get hung up on that. They say, well, I guess it, it couldn't have been a stroke because I don't see anything on the CT or MRI, uh, but we're clinicians. We examine patients, uh, and if they have it on examination, then they've had a stroke. So what's really important is trying to figure out the risk factors. What can we do to prevent someone from having a stroke in the first place? And then if they've had a stroke, what can we do to really work with them to try and reduce their risk for having a second stroke? So this is like the serenity prayer uh, that uh, people in 12-step programs do to try and understand the things you can, can control and the things you can't control. Uh, a lot of people go through life beating themselves up over things that you really have no control over. So age, I have no control over the fact that each year I'm older. Each year I look in the mirror and go, Dad, you know, I see, I see my father. Uh, I've, I can't control that. So as we age, after 55, the risk of stroke doubles just because in all of us the risk of having atherosclerosis, of having plaque in our arteries, uh, is there. Uh, during the Korean War, uh, when they did autopsies on soldiers, when they first realized that even 19-year-olds had some streaks of uh, atherosclerosis in their coronary arteries. Uh, and now if you look at the level of obesity in the United States, uh, and fast food diets, um, there's a lot that's going on in young people and we need to start early. Uh, gender makes a difference, I can't change that. Um, I've got an X and a Y chromosome and men are 19% more likely to have a stroke than women. And race makes a difference. We have this increased death rate in African Americans, uh, significantly greater than Caucasians. Uh, it probably is more than just of the increased risk of diabetes and hypertension and heart disease that exists in minorities, in uh, African Americans and in Hispanics, uh, but there's probably some genetic predisposition that, that puts it there. So we can't control that. But now let's talk about the risk factors that we can control. The number one risk factor that you can control and the number one risk factor for stroke is high blood pressure. And, and we're going to talk specifically about that it's got a lot of attention uh, in 2017, uh, just at the end of the year with new guidelines coming out. Um, I'm going to go over those, and it may be uh, a year from now or two years from now that it'll all change again. And that's why I'm, I'm giving you the date that we're doing this as February 6, 2018, just so it can be put in perspective. Heart disease is a risk factor if you have atherosclerosis in your coronary arteries. Um, there's a good chance you have it in your brain. And vice versa, what we frequently forget about is that someone who's had a stroke ha is at a much higher risk for myocardial infarction, that if you've got significant atherosclerosis in your brain, then you probably also have it in your heart. And we need to remember to work up that patient who's had the stroke for heart disease. If they come in and they say, well, no, I have no problem with heart disease, never been diagnosed, haven't had any problems, uh, but they've had a stroke, then we need to say, well, wait a minute, I think you're going to, let's do a cardiac workup because you're, you're at significant risk. We're going to talk about atrial fibrillation when the heart beats in an abnormal rhythm and blood clots form within the heart uh, and they can go to the brain. Diabetes mellitus, people think of, well, that's a disease of sugar, but it's a disease that affects blood vessels uh, and significant increase of heart disease and stroke in people with diabetes 
and tightly controlling uh, your blood sugar makes a big difference. Smoking, uh, there's nothing good about smoking. It's going to be interesting to see what data comes out on vaping. Uh, to me, it seems like, at least in San Antonio, you just can't go to a major intersection without seeing a smoke shop now with vaping. And I'm always amazed to be behind a car, and all of a sudden, this huge puff of smoke comes out of the side window. And it almost looks like the car is on fire, and it's somebody who's, who's vaping. Uh, alcohol abuse, uh, we're going to talk about... Uh, how much is good for you? Because people say, well, alcohol is good for me. It decreases heart disease and stroke. True. But I think you're going to be surprised when I show you the levels that we're talking about. Blood lipids. Uh, it's almost the topic of conversation um, when I'm playing golf with my buddies. Um, who's taking statins? How, what's your cholesterol level uh, these days? Uh, and we start statins after someone's had a stroke as prevention. And then carotid stenosis, that big carotid artery that's in your neck and gets a buildup, and we'll show you pictures of clots in those arteries uh, that can then embolize. Remember, that's when it goes from one place to another in the brain. You probably heard the term metabolic syndrome. Uh, you need to have three of the above. I mean, it's not something you want to have. This isn't something you strive to do. But people are always amazed by uh, the levels that put you in this category and then increases your risk of heart disease and stroke. So abdominal obesity, men 40 inches, women 35 inches. Uh, I live in Texas uh, for the last, I have to count them up, almost 45 years I guess. Uh, and here we have a lot of, a lot of cowboys, uh, a lot of people wearing their blue jeans. And so you get behind somebody and say, well that's a skinny looking cowboy until he turns around and you see he's got that big abdominal obesity and his waist, he'll tell you, well, I have a 32-inch waist, but where's he wearing his jeans? So um, this is a true abdominal girth, not where you happen to wear your pants way down below um, that belly that you're carrying. And carrying that type of belly is bad. It really puts you at risk for heart disease and stroke. High lipids, we're going to talk about that more. High blood pressure, we're going to define that a little more clearly, but you can see that number isn't that high for what we now call high blood pressure. And a fasting glucose over 100, or if you're on meds. Uh, and again, that's not that high of a number. So to get put into metabolic syndrome, you start to add these up, you're significantly increasing your risk of, of heart disease uh, and stroke. So blood pressure bullets, it, we already talked about, it's the number one risk factor for stroke. And, and look at that shocking number, one in five adults has hypertension. So if anytime you're sitting at work, you're out to dinner with friends, you're looking around a restaurant, uh, for sure if you're pulling into a fast food place, and uh, it all tastes good. I'm not going to tell you about all my guilty pleasures in my favorite fast food restaurants, um, but on the days when I feel like, well, I deserve it. Um, I may go have a, a double cheeseburger, and I think I already told you that, my green chili cheeseburger that I, I like the best. Look at this. Two-thirds of people over 65 years of, of age. So if I talk to most of my friends, because I'm over 65, we're all taking something. Uh, everybody's pretty much on something. It may be mild. It may just be a beta blocker. Uh, but as we get older, those arteries get stiffer. Uh, like your pipes in your house start to age and the chances of being hypertensive goes up. The figure that we're really trying to change is that about a third of people are unaware that they have hypertension. Uh, it's great that in all the drug stores and grocery stores now you can go sit down, have your blood pressure taken, but sit for a while uh, because if you've been running around, you're on a dead run home to get the groceries or pick up your prescription and you sit down, it, it may be high. So you want to sit for a little bit. Uh, home monitoring devices are really inexpensive these days to go ahead and get one of these automated machines that will measure your blood pressure, and it may save your life. And as we'll talk about in just a little bit, um, it's both systolic and diastolic matter. Uh, many years ago when I first went into practice, uh, we didn't worry about a little bit of high blood pressure. Now we do. We didn't worry so much about the systolic, the upper number, and we said, well, that's... That, we're not going to worry about that, but we only worried about the diastolic, the lower number. And now we worry and look at both of those.
So here's the guidelines, and here's the controversy, which I, I think could change by the time uh, this lecture just gets put out and published. So here were the guidelines that came out first in the latter end of 2017. It's the Ameri American College of Physicians and the American Academy of Family Practice um, put out guidelines, and a lot of controversy over these guidelines. And they came out and said that 150 over 90 in healthy individuals over 60 without risk factors. Well, the concern was that's a high number because it isn't that long ago that we had a category called prehypertension, and we said 120 over 80 was normal, 130 over 80 or 130 over 90, or I showed you in that last slide, 130 over 85 was prehypertension. And now the American College of Physicians really kind of liberalized this for people over the age of 60 and said, even if you don't have risk factors, it's okay to run what would now be considered a little high. And then they said, if you have risk factors, diabetes, heart disease, coronary artery disease, prior stroke, then 140 over 90. And that's the, sort of the old criteria that we had for many years. And they came out, and I mean, these are big organizations, well-known organizations, and there was a lot of um, criticism of this and a lot of response. And I'm going to, after I show you the American Heart Association guidelines next, tell you what I think is a practical approach to this. Then not that long after those guidelines, again at the end of 2017, the American Heart Association and American College of Cardiology came out with their official guidelines and endorsed by a gazillion, as I can't spell gazillion, but um, organizations. So if you look at that um, screenshot I took of the article that says 2017 and it's followed by all those organizations that endorsed it. So their criteria, which we're going to go over, would mean that 46% of uh, people in the United States have high blood pressure, and 80% of those over 65. So they've taken some criticism by saying, wait a minute, are we going to over-treat and treat too large of the population? And are we going to expose a large part of the population to side effects of the medication? Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that, and problems of overly treating the elderly. So they went back to normal is 120 over 80, and that was the old criteria of the last, oh, probably at least five years. Now, if your top number is 120, 129, bottom less than 80, that you're getting elevated. And then they put stages, stage one and stage two, instead of prehypertension. And you can see that they're much tighter in their numbers than uh, the American Academy of Family Practice. And it said anyone over 65 years or with at least 10% risk of heart attack or stroke in the next decade, the goal was 130 over 80. And this is pretty tight control of blood pressure. And therein lies the problem. Because if I look at our population that comes to the rehab hospital and has had a stroke, and you're going to try and get this tight control of blood pressure, um, you're going to see a fair number of patients that might be dizzy, that are going to fall. I have orthostatic hypotension, don't feel good, don't like the side effects and the way they feel on the medication. They may be apathetic, lethargic. Uh, so really what it comes down to is particularly in the elderly uh, or older population, I don't like to be considered elderly, is looking at that specific patient and saying, okay, they had a stroke and I want to prevent it and they've been running 10 miles a day and they're otherwise in fabulous condition uh, and I think they can really tolerate it. That, that they're not the 72 year old with hypertension, diabetes, who's obese uh, and because that patient may not at all tolerate having their uh, blood pressure brought down to 130 over 80. So the key here is to make you aware of the controversy and that this is the art of medicine in looking at each patient individually. Uh, and making a decision what's best for them. Uh, because a fall in the elderly and a broken hip, you know what that is. That can be a trip to the nursing home uh, and never leaving. Women have unique risks uh, for stroke. Uh, birth control pills uh, do increase the risk of stroke. Uh, we'll talk about it, who specifically. Uh, there's a risk in being pregnant. 
So when we look at the risk of taking birth control pills, we have to weigh it against, well, there's also a risk of having a stroke or having an intracerebral hemorrhage uh, and being pregnant. Uh, interesting enough, there are certain brain tumors that uh, are expressed uh, during pregnancy. The, some, the changes in hormones make them more apparent. We're going to talk about migraine and birth control pills, um, age is a factor, and uh, obesity and high lipids. So when you're looking at the risk of birth control pills. So let's look at migraine and birth control pills because this question comes up a lot and, and comes up a lot to neurologists and to uh, gynecologists. So if you just take migraine overall, it increases the risk of stroke in women, but it's less than 1% of all strokes. So as a rule, if a woman has migraine and wants to take birth control pills and it doesn't make her migraine worse, and she's a young woman, um, I think most uh, neurologists and most gynecologists um, don't have a problem with it. Now, with age, the risk of stroke goes up, so most neurologists and most gynecologists don't like to see oh, women as probably over the age of 35, certainly over the age of 40 on birth control pills, and particularly if they have migraine, because you can see the risk now starts to go up. Uh, and now we're going to add this low-dose estrogen, um, and it starts to increase it. But again, it's not a really big number, but if you have migraine, and if you have migraine with aura, um, and then your migraine is worse, most of us would prefer that you not take birth control pills. But look at the big number. If you smoke, the number skyrockets. So clearly, someone who smokes, uh, should stop anyway, but many people have problems with that. They have migraine, really shouldn't be on birth control pills. Atrial fibrillation is this abnormal heartbeat. So fibrillation is like this bag of, of worms. If we look over here uh, where my arrow is, I'm moving it because uh, it's not a really big arrow. And this is the atrium, and then blood goes from the atrium into the ventricle and gets popped out. If it's fibrillating, not contracting with each heartbeat, and it's like a bag of worms, blood clots can form in there, and then they can go down into the ventricle and get pushed out up to the brain all the way up here and cause a stroke. But the other thing that happens, people that are in intermittent atrial fibrillation, when they're in atrial fibrillation, these blood clots form. Then they go back into sinus rhythm and now they get a normal contraction and that blood clot gets pushed out, goes into the ventricle, and goes up. So it becomes really important to know whether someone's in atrial fibrillation. And over on the left side, you can see that it increases dramatically with age. Um, so I, I don't have the exact statistic as to if you're over the age of 60, over 65. Um, I have a fair number of friends who are in and out of atrial fib or in chronic atrial fib and are anticoagulated uh, on blood thinners, as we say. Uh, now we have ablation techniques where the uh, interventional cardiologist can go in uh, and try and destroy the electrical system uh, in certain areas of the heart so that it stops the atrial fibrillation. We used to uh, have everybody on uh, warfarin, Coumadin. Uh, and you get frequent blood tests, and now we have this whole group of other drugs which are the novel oral anticoagulants, Perdaxa, Eliquis, uh, that patients are on and, and are much easier uh, to take. There's still an increased risk of bleeding, increased risk of bleeding in your brain, uh, but it's less than, than warfarin. So what's really important is you need to learn to take your own pulse, and the best place to take it is up in your neck at the carotid artery, because for a lot of folks, particularly as you get older, it's hard to get a radial pulse down in the wrist. You may have arthritis in the wrist, um, not a, and it's hard to feel, but learn to take it in the carotid and see if you feel any abnormal beats. And if you do, you, you need to go get it checked. Uh, the new way of checking it, we have uh, not just having to wear these big Holter monitors that are cumbersome, but there's something called a Zeo patch. It's a little patch that can be put on the chest. You wear it for two weeks. Um, I'm, I'm holding my hand here to try and figure out. It's probably about oh, three inches long and two inches high, and it sticks there. You can shower with it. 
and take it off, you put it in a box, mail it in, and it recorded all your heartbeats for the last two weeks. If you feel like you had an abnormal heartbeat, you can record it, um, but it'll tell whether you've been in and out of atrial fibrillation or have any cardiac arrhythmia. So we're trying to educate people as they get older to take their own pulse, but it's really imperative um, that, that someone is screened for that as they get older because the incidence of atrial fibrillation really starts to go way up uh, over the age of 65. This is an ad. I have a whole collection of these ads. Um, back this one probably from the 50s, uh, and it says 20,679 physicians say luckies are less irritating. And my response always is less irritating than what? Turpentine? Uh, I have a, a little movie and, and we don't have time to show it, but it's on YouTube. You can go ahead and look up uh, cigarette commercials and there's one of a doctor making a house call. He gets called out at night and he stops in front of the house and lights up a cigarette to relax uh, and have uh, his cigarette before he goes in to see the patient. There's another ad that shows a surgeon having a cigarette. Um, he's in his scrubs, he's got his mask dangling down, and he's having a cigarette uh, before he goes in to operate, saying how much it relaxes him. Uh, so things change. So what I'm telling you today is what we know in 2018, and maybe in 2030 we'll look back and say, oh my God, do you believe that they actually thought that? But there was a time uh, when uh, everybody smoked. My, my dad was a three-pack a dayer. Um, it was just so common to see everybody do this. Remember we spoke earlier, you're going to be surprised about alcohol. So the recommendation for American Heart Association, and I have a graph that I could show you how the risk goes way up for heart disease and stroke beyond a point, is that for men it's no more than two drinks a day and women no more than one drink a day. But here's going to also be the surprise. What's considered a drink? Uh, one beer, 12 ounces, not the big one. How about four ounces of wine? So you go out to dinner or maybe you have a glass of wine at dinner. Um, one, it's a lot more than four ounces, I guarantee you. But how many of you are surprised to see that and say, well, wait, I go out to dinner and I have two glasses of wine. They're probably each at least six ounces. And I think that's moderation. I don't think I'm drinking heavily. But the curve starts to go up as far as increasing your risk of heart disease uh, and stroke. So, and particularly when you start to get, it's just one shot of, um, or one and a half ounces, uh, but most shots are generous of uh, scotch, vodka, uh, take any of your, uh, what are called spirits. So um, you need to think about that when you're drinking and you're thinking, well, wait, it's good for me. This is all good. But moderation has a whole different definition when we talk about heart disease and stroke. Uh, this revolutionized everything, the statins. The, uh, and now there are a bunch of generics, and there's a whole six, seven, eight different statins out there, uh, and it dramatically changed the ability to lower cholesterol. We would have people that exercised, and they were good about their diet and, and followed everything, and they just couldn't drop their cholesterol. And then we learned there's good cholesterol and bad cholesterol, so the LDL is the bad cholesterol, and that by taking a statin, uh, we were just able to drive these numbers way down to normal levels. So you can drop them by 23, 42%, but at the same time, you're reducing the risk of stroke by basically a third. And there's a whole group of patients who get put on statins after their stroke uh, with the idea that it reduces your risk of recurrent stroke. Definitely reduces death. Uh, and the statins work. Now, they're, they're not without side effects. There's a whole group of patients that get bad muscle pain that just don't tolerate them. Uh, they think that it's arthritis they're having. They, they don't know why they're aching so bad. Uh, most doctors clue the patients in, so they're aware of it pretty rapidly. Um, but we're starting to come out with some other ways of dealing with high cholesterol, although the statins are um, cost-effective and highly effective. Now, obesity is just epidemic in the United States, uh, and it's a primary risk factor for stroke and heart disease. But it's also a secondary risk factor because if you're obese, your blood pressure is going to be higher. I um, can't tell you how many patients I've had who got serious about dieting, lost weight, got off their antihypertensives, got their diabetes under control. Sleep apnea, the bad snoring, 
a person who in the middle of their sleep sounds like they're, they're going to stop breathing. Uh, obesity is a major risk factor. As people gain weight, you'll talk to their spouse and say, well, you know, they didn't used to snore, but ever since he gained that extra 30, 40 pounds, um, in the middle of the night, I, I'm not sure what's going on. It sounds as if he died. So sleep apnea, and, and I have to tell you right now, I can't remember whether I have a specific slide for it, but sleep apnea is, is a risk factor for heart disease and stroke, and sleep apnea increases after stroke. So that if you had someone who has a stroke, and then you talk to their spouse and follow up, and they say, you know, Joe didn't, he didn't snore that much before his stroke, but now he just snores up a storm, and then it sounds like he's, he just doesn't breathe for 20, 30 seconds, and it dramatically it can increase your risk of recurrent stroke, um, and so it's something we ought to screen for and be asking about all the time. Uh, we're doing a pretty good job because I'm always amazed when I'm flying the number of people that you see them putting their CPAP machines through security. Um, my number of friends uh, that are on CPAP at night uh, because of sleep apnea and uh, their spouses are really happy because they sleep better too. So what are stroke prevention guidelines? Know your blood pressure and control it. It's inexcusable not to know your blood pressure. It's kind of inexcusable not to make sure that your kids, once, for sure, once they're in college, have their blood pressure checked and know what it is because a lot of these young people get blood pressure at a young age and we can really prevent heart disease and stroke if we jump on it. Find out if you have atrial fib, learn how to take your pulse. If you smoke, you gotta stop. Um, and it, it is unusual today anymore. I mean, I, I'm sure there's, most of us have that same reaction when you're, you're out and all of a sudden you smell cigarette smoke, if you're in the United States at least, uh, and you kind of turn your head quickly because you're shocked. You go, whoa, you know, it's really unusual uh, to smell that anymore. Uh, if you drink alcohol, remember what moderation is. If you have high cholesterol, we're going to treat it aggressively. Um, diabetics now, we used to not be so interested in tight control 30 years ago. Now most diabetics are checking their sugar four or five times a day. They may be on insulin pumps. Uh, the new sophisticated pumps for uh, people with uh, juvenile diabetes that are very difficult to control, that where it actually measures the glucose level and, and then gives the amount of insulin that's needed. Uh, our ability now with um, all these electronic devices and microchips uh, is just amazing. What you're going to see in the next 10 years will be amazing. Uh, exercise, walking, walking's good. Um, as you get older, it's, it's jogging's hard. It's hard on your joints. So walking is good. Uh, sensible diet, not my green chili cheeseburger. Uh, Mediterranean diets, um, there's been lots of studies comparing one diet to another, and most of it gets down to portion control and just common sense. Uh, you want to check with your doctor about other problems. If Remember I said if you have heart disease, you want to be checked for peripheral arterial disease, do you getting pain in your legs when you're walking, and if you experience any stroke symptoms, we're going to talk about that calling 911. So what's acute treatment and prevention of stroke? Second stroke facts, what's, why, are we, why are we so concerned about uh, doing this and about preventing another stroke? Uh, at least one in four of people who've had a stroke each year will have another stroke in their lifetime. And so the first stroke, maybe it wasn't that disabling. And they go, you know, well, I really did well with that. And then the second stroke leaves them aphasic, can't speak, and totally hemiparotic on their right side. Uh, C. Miller Fisher, who was a famous neurologist at Harvard, called that super death, the inability to speak and paralyzed on the right side. Within five years of a stroke, 24% of women, 42% of men will experience a recurrent stroke. 80% of secondary strokes can be prevented. That's the, the tragedy of this is when you see someone with a, a second stroke or a third stroke and you realize that no one sat down with them or they didn't follow through. So what's a TIA, a transient ischemic attack? It's when there's a reduction in blood flow to an area of the brain, but then it gets restored either by collateral flow, other blood vessels taking over, or it was reduced, but not enough to cause permanent damage, and the patient recovers. So it's transient, ischemic, not enough blood, uh, and attack, so a TIA. It's an important warning sign 
because 10% of patients with a TIA will have a stroke within the next 90 days. And most patients with stroke, though, don't have a TIA, so those that do, we really want to get aggressive about. We really want to say, well, you know, I just had a little numbness, a little tingling, a little weakness, it got better, don't worry about it. But the reason we jump on is, look at that, the majority of them occur within the next 72 hours. And if you do an MRI scan, and remember I said 50% will be abnormal, so that the TIA may have resolved, but you go ahead and look at the scan, they had a stroke. Um, so just, just because it got better doesn't mean we ignore it. We treat this as also a medical emergency and something to really jump on and get excited about. So what does a stroke look like? Um, the abrupt onset, a stroke, a bolt out of the blue, and then the signs of stroke, facial drooping, difficulty with speech, they may have trouble finding the words that they want, they may be dysarthric, have slurred speech, weakness of one side of the body, it may just be an arm and a face, or it may be a leg, depends on which artery is involved. So middle cerebral artery, it may be arm and face, Maybe the leg too, but if it's anterior cerebral artery, it may just be just the leg. Loss of vision, and, and we don't have time to go into all of this. It's, it's a whole other lecture. Um, and then severe headache for hemorrhagic stroke. Worst headache you've ever had in your life. That's what we use for subarachnoid hemorrhage or an aneurysm that's, that's broken. So the American Heart Association, American Stroke Association, gives you this mnemonic to remember fast, uh, so it makes it easy. Ask the person to smile for face. There's one side droop. A is arms, ask them to raise both arms. Can they do that? Speech, S, um, are they dysarthric? Do they have slurred speech, trouble finding their words, stammering, stuttering? And time is of the essence. So you've got to call 911. Oops, let me go back to 911. So we just had the Super Bowl. Uh, what is today? Today is Tuesday. Super Bowl was Sunday. It was a great game. Um, we won't talk about who you, who you may have wanted to win, whether you wanted Philadelphia or the Patriots. Uh, but what happens is, so you're watching the game, and now one side of your body starts to go numb, and it's getting a little weak, and your family's saying, come on, we got to call, we got to call, the 911 take you to the hospital. No, no, I want to see the end of the game. I want to see the end of the game. You don't have time. And you don't want to be calling your doctor because what if I have my phone turned off by accident? What if I'm out of cell range? What if I'm slow to respond? Time is brain. Time is critical. So you call 911. Do not call your doctor. They'll call your doctor when you get to the emergency room. The ambulance, the 911 folks, the paramedics, they'll know which hospital is the stroke center in your community? Who can administer TPA? Who can do interventional neurology and take that clot out and uh, do clot retrievers? And where should you go? Because if you go to the wrong hospital, um, now you just lost time. And we're going to show you why, why time is brain and time is critical. Uh, this is a case of ischemic stroke. If we look on the left side, uh, this white arrow, there should be an artery there. So here's the carotid artery coming up, branching off into the middle cerebral artery, uh, and this is closed off. And now you can see after getting a clot buster, and this is really after getting, they went up and retrieved the clot and got it out uh, where I took this from, just because it was such a nice slide. You can see they went up, they probably gave clot busters, then they went up and retrieved the clot, and they were able to restore the blood flow to all of these, all of these arteries. So TPA is a clot buster. It goes in and it destroys the clot. Let me get my arrow out of the way. We don't need it here. Um, and it used to be that you had to give it within three hours. And if you didn't get there within three hours, you didn't get it. Well, the criteria changed. I think it's a couple years now, uh, at least, uh, and went up to four and a half hours. But despite going up to four and a half hours, the biggest challenge is getting somebody there in time because what the data shows is that those people that get it earlier, that get it within the first hour, first two hours, have much better outcomes 
than the people who got TPA at four hours, four and a quarter hours. Now, going in with clot retrievers has changed this, as I'll show you, because now that time has been extended up to 24 hours. But TPA in time, this was a big study of almost 60,000 patients. The average onset of treatment was over two hours, 144 minutes, but only 9% got it within the first 90 minutes. So you can see how much work we need to do. Now this is from 2013 and, and hopefully our data is better. But the problem is people sit around, they want to see if it's going to get better, they want to see if it's going to clear. When you hit the ER, I mean everything gets moving. It's like a heart attack. I always tease that if there's a big line at the ER, I'm going to tell them I have chest pain because they have a time you hit the door to the time you're on the cath table um, and then there's a time for stroke from the time you hit the door to the time that the drip starts at TPA that gets monitored. And then I would say, oh no, 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 it's my back that hurts, um, but just teasing. The, the key then is when you hit the ER and you tell them there's symptoms of a stroke, the clock starts and there's a whole checklist, are you a candidate for TPA? Um, we have mobile stroke units now with CT scanners actually in them in some major communities. Um, many ERs now are putting CT scanners right in the ER so they don't have to take you to radiology and you can just get right in the CT scanner and see whether you're going to be a candidate. If you get the TPA down here, if you look at it says second one checkpoint, who got it in that 90 minute window compared to the later one, they were 51% more likely to walk at the time of discharge and 33% more likely to make it home. And that's the goal. The goal is, I mean, we all want to go home. Um, we want to be with our family, we want to be in our own bed, and we want also for our symptoms to resolve. So, so time is brain, time is critical. It says, unfortunately, 5 to 10% of patients with an ischemic stroke are eligible for TPA. So we've the number one reason is, is time, is that they don't get there in time. Now we've expanded that with clot retrievers that I'm going to show you, and that, that has really helped immensely, particularly if you live in a major um, metropolitan area that, that has this ability. So we need to enhance the delivery of care with stroke centers. Um, that's why you need to call 911. They'll know exactly where to take you. Uh, a lot of telemedicine now. So if you live in a rural community, if you live outside, let's say an hour away, um, you'll be hooked up with telemedicine and that doctor, the neurologist, may be at a TV screen and a computer in Denver, Colorado and doing a neurologic exam on you and making the assessment. They see the CT scan and this is what we call drip and ship. So they'll start the TPA drip because you've met the criteria and then send you to the major metropolitan area where if you're going to need clot retrieval and more sophisticated care, uh, you can get it. We now have advanced imaging, which is beyond the scope of this lecture, where we can actually do a scan and it shows us how much of the brain is damaged, how much is in that intermediate zone, what we call a penumbra or a halo around, uh, that may be salvageable, uh, and then can make a decision as to how aggressive to be. Uh, this is called endovascular thrombectomy, and, and this is for clot retrieval, and this is not to endorse um, this product over another product. This was a study in the New England Journal. You can see the number of centers and authors involved, and they went up to 24 hours. Um, we call a mismatch, and that's, again, beyond getting into this, and it's looking at um, how much of the brain is permanently damaged, how much... Uh, can be retrieved. I'm going to get my pointer back, so I did that, but I didn't get my pointer back. So let's look at the upper right-hand corner, and you see that I'm going to try once more. Uh, there's my pointer. And this is a stent, so a catheter is put up in the groin, and they can thread it all the way up into these small arteries in the brain. And this is a stent. Uh, this is very much like what is put in coronary arteries uh, to hold them open after they get rid of the clot. So we're going to take this mesh, this retriever, and poke it. You can see it's going all the way through the clot. It's coming out the other side. And then it's going to be retrieved. And what actually we also have is the ability to suck these out. 
vacuum retrievers where they actually suck the clot out. Um, and it's amazing that we can get into these very small arteries all the way up in the brain and now we have this larger time frame and it can be done in patients that have gotten TPA maybe they still have clot they haven't gotten total reversal of their symptoms and you can see here down in this lower right hand corner that we're pulling this clot out um, and we're going to see more and more of this it needs to be done in major medical centers um, but we have the ability to get people there and now with telemedicine with drip and ship and now we have this extended time frame we, we just have a much greater um, period of time to work with so the other part of prevention is why do people get clots and this is the, the uh, let's go back to that the platelets are the sticky little things in the blood so that when you cut yourself on your leg or your arm and it starts to get kind of gelatinous and you get a clot and stop bleeding well these platelets adhere to each other so look at the bottom part it says vessel wall, in, wall injury so the artery inside the brain or the carotid artery um, has been injured and now the platelets start to stick together they aggregate so aspirin and the drugs we're going to talk about prevent this aggregation gets activated and then they adhere to each other so we want to prevent this from happening it's an old Bayer aspirin ad from a long time ago and here's you can actually see heroin they used to put heroin as a sedative and for coughs they put it in cough syrup highly effective just like hydrocodone and codeine is highly effective in stopping coughs the problem is that it's highly addictive but here you can see Bayer made aspirin and when this first came out nobody not this ad but nobody believed that something as simple as aspirin could prevent heart attacks and strokes and what it does is it stops those platelets from sticking together and we put out a group of platelets from our bone marrow and they last about 21 days if you take an aspirin and you low dose aspirin works fine in Europe it's 50 milligrams in the United States it's 81 milligrams we used to call it baby aspirin we don't anymore because aspirin for fever in children can cause something called rye syndrome that a lot of children died from so we don't give aspirin uh, to children with fever but an aspirin in an adult stops the platelets from aggregating or sticking together and we use it for secondary prevention of stroke and heart attacks or somebody's had a heart attack or a stroke or somebody with a lot of risk factors if you don't have risk factors and you haven't had a stroke or heart disease we don't recommend taking an aspirin every day uh, because the increased incidence of bleeding in your stomach with it it decreases the risk of stroke by about 30 percent the combined reduction of what we call vascular death heart attack stroke is about a fourth so it's highly effective I mean it's, it's amazing when it, this was first studied and came out and I think it was some general practitioner who was or internist was giving this to the patients in his practice and noticed it um, and people thought it was quackery really didn't think it would be that simple so the doses range from one regular aspirin a day uh, there's no advantage to taking more aspirin a bigger dose and you increase your risk of a GI bleed or having stomach problems there's other antiplatelet therapy the three main ones are aspirin we talked about low dose 81 milligrams some people give their patients an enteric coated full dose aspirin so it doesn't upset the stomach Plo clopidogrel I almost got that as a tongue twister which is Plavix um, and Agronox which is a combination of aspirin and dipyridamol dipyridamol was tried uh, by itself and, and didn't work um, and then was combined with aspirin in a combined tablet called Agronox and all three drugs are equally effective in, in reducing it uh, reducing recurrent stroke and heart attack but clearly I mean aspirin is the least expensive even though the others are generic now they're still much more expensive than aspirin so most patients get tried on aspirin if they're an aspirin failure then they may get switched to uh, clopidogrel Agronox and some patients depending on what's going on with them may be candidate for a novel anticoagulant uh, there's been some recent trials to show that when someone has had uh, a TIA or a stroke uh, and has a good outcome combining aspirin and clopidogrel 
uh, can reduce the incidence of recurrent stroke during the first 90 days, but we do not continue it beyond 90 days because beyond 90 days you increase the risk of bleeding. Uh, so that it's only for 90 days and uh, most, if not all, neurologists, uh, cardiologists now are aware of this. But sometimes people kind of get lost um, and they just keep taking it because they have it. So it's important if you're a nurse, um, if you're a therapist seeing these patients, if you're a doctor watching this, to check in with that patient and make sure that they're not going beyond the 90 days. What's changed things drastically is this whole group of drugs called novel oral anticoagulants. Uh, Coumadin was around for many, many years, and we all know about getting INRs and trying to tightly control that. Uh, we don't have to do blood tests for the novel oral anticoagulants. They are um, as effective in non-valvular uh, atrial fibrillation in preventing stroke. For valvular atrial fibrillation, people need to be on, on warfarin. Uh, we're starting to get drugs that can reverse these. One of the problems with the novel oral anticoagulants is that we didn't have drugs to reverse them, where for Coumadin, you give fresh frozen plasma, vitamin K, and you can reverse it if you need to do surgery or the patient's bleeding. Uh, we didn't have drugs to reverse the novel oral anticoagulants, and we're starting to get them now. Uh, I think Pradaxa has one, and we'll start to see them uh, for the others. Uh, we're getting very close to the end here now. This is a carotid endarterectomy. If we uh, start to feel in the neck um, where this box is, this is where I asked you to take your pulse. We have a carotid artery on each side, and it splits into an internal carotid artery that supplies most of the blood to one half of the brain, not to the posterior circulation or brainstem, and then an external carotid artery that goes to the face. And this is an area with a lot of turbulence. If you're a fisherman, um, and let's say I'm fly fishing up in Idaho, I married a forest ranger's daughter a long time ago, so we fly fish up there. Uh, there's turbulence here, and this is where the food collects, and the fish will kind of hang out here, so this is a good place to fish. But what happens because of that turbulence, it's a place where the artery gets roughened, and because it gets roughened, We'll go over here, the cholesterol can start to collect on it. And here is, there's an artery cardal, I mean, a uh, operation called a carotid endarterectomy, and you can see they pull it out, and look on that left side, that's what was pulled out of a patient, and so that's atherosclerosis, hardening of the artery, the brown stuff, uh, it's blood clot in there that can break off and go to the brain. Uh, and I don't think we're going to talk about criteria, there's a whole criteria of who do you operate on if someone is asymptomatic greater than 80 percent uh, stenosis um, we'll usually operate on them if it's less we'll treat them medically if someone was symptomatic and has a high grade stenosis of the carotid artery they'll have surgery so what happens to stroke patients we're going to close real quickly um, stroke outcomes, if you're independent of bowel, remember we talked about ADLs, you're three times more likely to live in the community. If you're independent of bowel feeding or bowel and grooming six times, and all of them, it's 14 times. So activities of daily living are king. The key of whether you're going to go home and quality of life is frequently bladder and bowel as continence. And that's why in rehab we work so hard on bladder and bowel programs. What happens to all comers? everybody who's had a stroke, 20% make a full recovery in two weeks. We love to take credit for these people. If they get sent for rehab, we say, didn't we do a great job? Uh, and everybody gets interested in making sure they get a lot of care, but the truth is a lot of them may do just fine on their own. We have the lower half, 20% that remain non-ambulatory and dependent, and on my last slide, I'm gonna talk about what, what should we offer those patients. But look at this, 60% will benefit from aggressive inpatient rehab. So if there are, let's, I'm gonna round it up to 800,000 new strokes a year, uh, strokes, not new strokes a year. Let's say there's 500,000 patients that are candidates for aggressive rehab, and yet only a fraction of that get what they need. Many patients don't get what they need. They may get a minimal amount of therapy, they may get sent to the wrong place. They may get sent to a skilled nursing facility and not get therapy. And as I said earlier, if after a stroke you go to a skilled nursing facility, you're three times less likely 
to make it home than if you go uh, to an inpatient rehab. And a lot of times we ignore that bottom 20%. We say, gee, that stroke is just too severe to do anything about. Um, there's nothing we can do. Uh, we're just going to send them to a nursing home. And, and, and the, the, the fallacy is, well, we'll send them there until they get better. But if you don't provide the care, they don't get better. Uh, so what should we do? We need caregiver training. If I can train Mrs. Smith to transfer Mr. Smith and to take care of him, I can get him home. So if she can learn to transfer him and get him in and out of the wheelchair into the bed, I have a good chance of getting him home. Bladder and bowel, remember highest correlation of whether you go home and self-esteem. If I can get Mr. Smith on a bladder and bowel program, they get him home. And I want to get him properly seated, splinted, and positioned. Because what do we see? The patient went home or went to a skilled nursing facility, didn't get the proper type of hemi wheelchair, wheelchair cushion, didn't get splinted, ended up with terrible contractures in not only their extremities, but their spine and neck. And now someone says, well, why don't we try rehab? But you've lost the battle because they have all these fixed contractures. And feeding, many of these patients are aspirating. They say, oh, he's got a bad cough. And the problem is that he's aspirating and you really need to do swallowing studies. Uh, and so there's a whole bunch to do with this lower 20% that we frequently forget to do. So with that, I thank you for joining us today. Uh, please fill out the questionnaire in order to get uh, credit if you're doing this uh, through our um, credit program. Uh, please feel free to contact us. I'm always looking for new ideas for any suggestions you have about this lecture. Um, and you can call this number, uh, you can go to the website, and we thank you for joining us and hope that you will join us on uh, additional educational programs.